So the first thing I want to go through, um, and I've got a short time here. Um, I thought I had an hour, but I don't, so I might be have to go pretty quickly through these. Is now this one I want to set you up for the background for the philosophy um, for sex offender policies in general, as well as it's so it's certainly applicable to the child pornography context. So what we have here is a moral panic that started about 20 years ago. The moral panic often has been about specific cases where a child has been sexually molested and often killed. And the moral panic then was the media picks up specific incidences, usually one-off incidences, and then they hype it in the media. Politicians then have come on board, because for politicians, it's not much of a downside to wanting to and being very out front and public about wanting to get more severe about sex offenders against children. And then the public gets involved and the public believes this moral panic and there's this fear then of sexual predators, right? So that's kind of what you all are dealing with, which is you know what politician wants to come out publicly and say, I want to reduce the punishment or reduce investigating uh, sex offenders as against children. But the other interesting thing that is relatively unique to sex offenses, and again, it also applies to child pornography offenders, is this idea of this assumption of a mental illness. Now, for child pornography offenders, you can imagine that the mental illness often is about pedophilia. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. And then, in addition, it's this philosophy of this assumption that sex offenders and child pornography offenders more particularly are at risk of future dangerousness, that they are going to about to molest children or molest multiple children. So this is underlying the philosophy. So it's a politically astute bandwagon against a marginalized group where nobody except for you all are standing up for this particular group. And there's a fear of danger. So this is kind of underlying the increase in the federal investigation of child pornography offenders as well as the increase in sentencing that we have seen over the years. Now one of the interesting things here too is this idea of connecting pathology and evil, and the pathology being the mental illness here, relatively unique to sex offenders and also applicable to child pornography offenders. So the assumption is the mental illness being pedophilia for child pornography offenders is about the assumption of less self-control, i.e. they can't control themselves and the assumption that they will be reoffending contact offenses as against children. The other interesting thing here and very unique is, now in terms of the law, often if we think offenders have a mental illness, we're empathetic. So for example, the idea behind not guilty by reason of insanity is the assumption we can't hold them responsible for their behavior and therefore we commit them if they're found not guilty by reason of insanity to a hospital rather than imprisonment. That's, that's been upended for sex offenders. The mental illness is actually seen to be even more evil. And so the pathology and evilness is conflated. The other assumption here then in terms of this assumption of mental illness as well as the assumption of future dangerousness is believing that everybody is alike, so that all child pornography offenders are alike, they're a homogenous class. And as I'll go through here um, with my slides and presentation is that's not true, for, um, the social sciences studies are showing that's not true, that they're not all alike, they don't all have an illness. So the management of sex offenders then has come on a risk-based model. So notice that incapacitation is huge with sex offenders and child pornography offenders. So particularly for child pornography offenders, one of the interesting aspects of incapacitation is often, at least at the federal level, is they're incarcerated for a long period of time. And even after incarceration, one of the incapacitating ideas is for supervised release is never have access to the internet. That's incapacitating, right? Punishment. Certainly, we are extreme, at least at the federal level for child pornography defendants, at extreme punishment. So their sentences have increased over time. And often in the, at the federal level, the sentences for child pornography defendants, and mostly what I'm talking here is not the production, but the, for example, downloaders, sentences are more than contact offenses at the federal level. 
And then treatment. I, and I do on purpose have treatment as a smaller uh, because it is part of the risk-based model, uh, but it's not as nearly as prevalent or as stressed as the incapacitation and uh, the punishment. The treatment at the federal level, many of the child pornography downloaders are, um, are required or at least encouraged to get sex offender treatment at the federal level. But what's also kind of interesting is they're treated the same as contact offenders um, at the federal level in terms of treatment. Next, in terms of this, it has been politicized that child pornography offenders have this disease and risk. And some additional support I have for this idea is that, yes, in sex offender laws, part of what's driving it is the assumption of sexual predators that are lurking around the corner for your children. For child pornography offenders, kind of interesting, the the sexual pred predation is assumed to be online, so that these downloaders are online predators stalking children. Uh, but it's largely a mythical thing, um, as I'll go through, because the assumptions of child pornography offenders is that they are actually contact offenders, and most studies indicate that that's not the case. A cottage industry of experts. So part of my politicization is there's now sex offender treatment specialists and assessment <coughs> specialists I think are somewhat behind this increase in the investigation as well as increase in punishment of child pornography offenders. Right? So for example, the Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers is one of these. Notice though, and I'm going to call it somewhat self-interested, so notice if you've got a clientele, don't you want to grow your clientele? So if their original clientele was contact offenders, won't you grow your potential base by including the non-contact child pornography downloaders? Right? So part of my support for that then is comes from the DSM-5. So the DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is basically the Bible of mental disorders. And as they should, and it comes from the American Psychological Associations, as they should as scientists, is they should normally update their material as their science has progressed. So in terms of this, they had then, a few years ago, uh, started the process of updating from DSM-4 to DSM-5. Now, there are two issues in the DSM-5, which actually was issued last year, but two issues which supports my idea here that the child pornography offending has been politicized as mental disease, two issues relevant to the paraphilias. And the paraphilias are the mental disorders of sexual deviance. So for my purposes here is one of the things that had happened in this progress of the DSM-5 that's relevant here is for pedophilia. So one of the working group had started out with a proposal in the DSM-5 that pedophilia would include almost a presumption that child pornography viewing was indicative of pedophilia. So simply the behavior, simply the viewing they proposed was almost by definition uh, in, um, uh, indicating pedophilia. Now luckily that didn't end up being the case. It finally was dropped. But my, for my purposes here is just support for my idea of politicizing it and my support for my idea that in part it's self-interest from a group of people wanting to expand their base of potential clientele. The next one uh, that was in the DSM-5 was the introduction of hebophilia being officially recognized. Hebophilia, oh, so let me go back. Pedophilia is supposed to be about a sexual preference in prepubescent children. Hebophilia expands it far beyond to a sexual preference in either pubescent or postpubescent. So the DSM-5, the original creation of the um, new pedophilia would have included hebophilia, i.e. sexual preference even for postpubescent. Isn't that potentially indicative of wanting to expand the base of mental disorder? Certainly, that's problematic, and one of the reasons that it ended up, luckily, not ending up in the final DSM-5 is because there was a lot of backlash from scientists who said, how is it possibly 
deviant for men, usually men, sorry, but statistics show that, to be interested in postpubescent, meaning fully developed teenagers. It wasn't, and, and actually the international community was even more horrified because actually worldwide, the uh, age of consent is 14. It's only 16 here in the US. That's a legal definition versus what should be considered a mental disorder. Okay. So luckily it didn't end up, but I do want to warn you, the fact that hepophilia is not recognized in the DSM does not mean by definition the law does not recognize it as a mental disorder. And you might say, how come? So the, for purposes of the law and for purposes of recognizing a mental disorder for legal decisions, such as civil commitment, for purposes of the law, we like to say, hey, we might recognize what other disciplines will do, but it's not defining to us. It's not definitive whether or not hepophilia is recognized in the DSM, and indeed courts have officially recognized and acknowledged that as long as an expert is willing to testify that hepophilia, for example, is a mental disorder, they have officially recognize it in the law even for long-term civil commitment. Okay. So even though not recognized, just as a warning, some courts, in fact, there are two federal judges in recent years who had said, no, hepophilia is not qualified to be a mental disorder for civil commitment. They were overturned by the federal appellate court. One of the judges, interestingly enough, is the chair of the United States Sentencing Commission. She was overturned by a court that said, yes, hepophilia we recognize uh, officially as being a, an appropriate mental disorder for civil commitment. So in any, any event, I kind of wanted to give you a little bit about some of what I think is politicizing it and some potentially self-interest uh, by a cottage industry of sexual treatment experts. Now let me move on a little bit then to the federal, the, a little bit of the history of the federal involvement in child pornography investigation. So interestingly enough, in terms of uh, the feds, child pornography itself was not against the law from a federal perspective until 1977. At that point, the law was only about production and only about child pornography that amounted to obscenity and only for under 16. It wasn't until 1984 that distribution at the federal level was criminalized. So notice here that the federal involvement in child pornography is a relatively recent thing. And in, since then it has taken off in terms of the number of, of investigations the feds do. It wasn't until 1990 that possession was at the federal level criminalized. So since then, the feds have been on a streak. Every year, they increase the number of investigations they are doing. They now have task forces. They highlight their task forces. The feds love their involvement in this area. They highlight it. They publicize it. They, they issue a lot of press releases, even for the downloaders, when they arrest the downloaders. But what I argue is that, just like the drug war, what has happened is, instead of and I should conceptualize this as there, the Fed's investigation of child pornography, even viewers, is part of their overall strategy as against child sexual exploitation offenses. So they envelop it in terms of all of the offenders who are actually in, including committing contact offenses as against children or trafficking children. It's part of their overall strategy. But what I argue is just like the drug war, instead of going after those traffickers the, or the ones who are actually committing contact offenses against children, what they've gone down to is the lowest level. And they are, are arresting and investigating more often the, simply the per people in their homes who are downloading. Reasons just like the drug war, it's easier to get them. There are more of them. Okay. So unfortunately, they're getting the downloaders. And, and part of it is just it's easier now with the technology because the feds mostly go after the online downloaders. 
Their technology allows them to get more of them, and it's easier to get them than to actually get the people, for example, who are more likely to be committing contact offenses against children in homes, because it's harder to get into those homes. So that's kind of what I conceptualize the reason for the increase. And what's interesting is, if you ever go onto the FBI's website, is they will issue press releases announcing an arrest of just a downloader with the same ferocity as they, for example, issue press releases as against the traffickers of children that they find. They see no difference. Now, we might say, why is that? And so I'm going to go through how the feds conceptualize child pornography offenders that is behind how they uh, uh, how they view um, this and how they kind of um, support their philosophies here. One is they conflate these things. Remember I had introduced the idea of the mental disorder? So they conflate, for example, being pedophilia with being a child porn downloader with being a molestate, m molester. The presumption is at the federal level, although this is true at the state level, but I'm really doing fed today, is the presumption is that a child pornography viewer is a proxy for molestation. The assumption is that child pornography viewing, that most of them have committed a contact offense against children in the past, and the assumption is, remember the idea of future risk, the assumption is they will do it in the future. And again, this idea, this, the idea that they want to investigate, they want to incapacitate, and they want to send it, sentence for a long period of time is the idea of the mental illness being pedophilia. They conflate all of these, even though that's circular reasoning. So for example, they assume that child pornography viewing must be, and remember that in the DSM-5, the promoters wanted this to actually be official, the presumption is the behavior is itself indicative of the disease, as well as the behavior, just the viewing itself, is presumed to be a risk for future molestation as well as past. They do this now, though, as well as against molesters, or oh, sorry, as online solicitation is as well this presumption. The problem, or uh, one of the problems I will indicate though is, at least for federal law, child pornography is anything under 18, any sexually explicit photo under 18. Drawing back here, my idea though, in my introduction of hebophilia is, is it really deviant for men to be interested, sorry, I, it usually is about men and girl, and, um, to be interested in postpubescent women? The U.S. is unique on this. The U.S., we have also conflated the law with what should be considered a mental disorder. What I mean by that is in most countries, and most European countries, the age of consent is 14. Here, the age of consent in most states is 16. But we have conflated this idea of age of consent, although, again, it's actually not necessarily the same because child pornography is under 18. We've conflated that with mental disorder. So the fact the age of consent might be 16 doesn't necessarily mean that it's a mental disorder or it's deviant to be sexually interested in somebody at least to the extent that their body has turned into pubescence or post-pubescent. But the law has basically ignored that. So I want to go through, though, then, that these are some of the presumptions as to why the feds have increased their investigation and continue to every year, as well as why sentencing at the federal level, sentences have increased also every year quite dramatically. So these are some myths. I want, I've had this up here and I have some additional slides and social science support, but I want to introduce each of these to you. But these are the myths that underlie the, fe underlie the federal system. Again, one is that a molester is a pedophile by nature but that's not true, they are not synonymous. And again, I'll introduce you to some reasons that somebody might molest a child, sexually molest a child, and actually not be a pedophile in terms of mental disorder. Uh, the assumption too is that child pornography itself is indicative of a preferred sexual interest in children. Well, we know now studies show that a lot of child pornography defendants 
They might have a lot of child pornography on their computers, but they also, many of them, not all, but many also have a lot of adult porn. And again, I'll, be, I'll, I'll go through it in just a little bit about reasons for that. Uh, there's also a presumption uh, that the feds have that the child pornography viewing will lead to the individual acting out the scenes, i.e. they will actually go molest a child, but there's little su support for that. Now, I don't mean here for any of these that there aren't cases where some of these do co-occur. So some molesters certainly are pedophiles, for example. <laughs> some who view child pornography will actually act out the scenes. It's just the presumption, though, that most or almost all of them do that is just not supported. So, for example, uh, there are some uh, social science studies that have done interviews of child pornography defendants. Some of them have said, actually, viewing it, and, and it were pedophiles and were sexually interested in children, some of them said, actually, that, that sated my desire, that, that, so I didn't go act out on it. Okay. So the idea that it whets their appetite to go act out. Social science, I, don't, I haven't found any support for that um, at all. Uh, my slippery slope here, too, is that means that if we assume that what one views is what they're going to act out on, isn't that a slippery slope to a lot of other stuff? For example, um, I like the show Dexter. Does anybody know Dexter? <laughs> So Dexter is a TV show where this is a, a vigilante who goes out and for, the, for killers, people who have killed usually innocent victims he goes after, if the system has not been willing to investigate and prosecute, he then goes and kidnaps them and then kills them in very bloody ways, usually letting out all their blood. And of course, this is you know, on TV, so you, know, you see all the blood letting and all, and it's very gory. I like Dexter, <laughs> and I, I watch it, but I'm, if, if our presumption is by viewing what you view, you're going to act out, I don't think it's very likely I'm going to go kidnap somebody and then gorily blood let them. <laughs> it's, just, I mean, it's a slippery slope here, but it's, it is what um, has happened. And then finally, kind of one of the assumptions is that uh, child pornography viewers will be online solicitors of children. Yes, there are some who do both, but they're also not synonymous. So what is some of my support for this? So why would somebody view porn or engage in otherwise risky behavior online if they're actually not molesters in the past or going to be in the future? Studies. This comes from research studies. And by the way, I have for everything I say, I have lots of social science support in papers I have publicly available. I'll have a uh, website you can download these papers. I don't, I'm using download in a very innocent way. Uh, but you can get these because um, for you all who are advocates, I think you should have the social science and, and give that to politicians and whoever you're talking to. And so I've done a thorough job. I tried to do this. Um, every time I write something is I don't simply assert things, is I find a lot of social science um, papers to support it, as well as um, medical science um, in terms of mental illness. Uh, but a lot of them who are engaging in risk behavior sometimes is simply fantasy. That's partly why, for example, I like Dexter, I like to engage in the fantasy that I want to be a vigilante and go seek justice as against somebody the system hasn't, but it's not like I'm about to go do it. It's also deviance. So in terms of this, I want to get back to the ideas. Um, a lot of child pornography defend defendants have on their computer a lot of adult porn. What some of them in social science uh, interviews have shown is, what a lot of them say is they started out downloading adult porn and got to eventually child porn. So that was not their preference. That was not what they originally were seeking out. And you might say, why, why do that then? Well, we have men, for example, we have uh, serotonin levels, dopamine. So when we engage in deviant behavior, sometimes that gives us a pleasure rush. And it's because of these neurotransmitters that allow us the rush. And for a lot of them, it's they know they're engaging in deviant behavior simply by seeking out adult porn. But to get that same rush, you need more. right? And so what they argue, and I think um, so, or science, medical science actually will support, is the idea that they want more deviant, deviant, deviant pornography to be able to get that same dopamine 
brush for pleasure. Uh, so again, it may be the idea is that even though even downloading child pornography is not itself definitive of being pedophilic. They may not have a sexual preference for children. It may be part of just increasing the deviance. Uh, addiction, online addiction, just in general, <coughs> has meant that some people have accumulated a large stash, <laughs> excuse me, my voice, of child pornography. Immaturity. <coughs> One of the very recent things we're seeing in child pornography cases <coughs> is probably a co-occurrence of other mental disorders. So for example, cognitive disabilities, where many, not all, but many of these defendants we believe now probably have some kind of cognitive disorder where they actually see the children as their peers, not as children and them as adults, but they see them more intellectually and from an age perspective as, as people they might date or they actually might think are appropriate sexual partners. But that's a relatively recent recognition that I'm seeing public defenders, for example, are contacting me to ask me, have you heard of studies connecting it to other mental uh, or cognitive disorders? Social ties, I mean, again, we're, we're here still on reasons somebody might view child porn, but it might not be indicative of them being molesters or, or being sexually interested, particularly in children, is some, many of them are like in their basement, socially isolated, and this is a way to have some kind of social contact. These are the people who probably are distributing though or sharing the photos because they can be in the comfort of their home and still have a social life. We see that actually is a relatively common perspective. And then many of them are simply connect collectors. So the fact that they may have a ton of child porn on their computers, again, is not itself necessarily indicative of pedophilia or being a molester. Is many of them, and I kind of relate this back to the addictive behavior, um, is they like to, or many of them we have found, like to establish collections. Many of them are very particular in their computers about classifying and putting in folders their various ones. Some of them too, there are some child pornography collections on, available online that there are collections. So they're the same theme or the same person. And some of these individuals then, in kind of their addictive behavior, want to make sure they get all of them. And so that may be a reason that they have collected a whole ton of them. But let me go, go into two here in my idea of um, child pornography viewing is not necessarily molesters. Why would some people molest and not be pedophilic? Well, there are some reasons. Now, some are. Again, I won't want to say this is always true. There are absolutely a lot of child molesters are pedophilic. They are sexually interested in children, but not all of them are. Okay. So here are some reasons. Many who um, commit sexual acts against children, and here I'm talking about contact offending, it's antisociality. They don't care who their victims are. So it's not their sexual preference. Uh, some are out of depression. Uh, drug and alcohol is involved in many of these incidents. Uh, simply having pro-criminal attitudes. Not again here, my focus is on why some might molest children and not be sexually, or preferentially sexually interested in children. The, probably the biggest reason is opportunity. Okay, also con connected somewhat to the foregoing. So molestation against children, that kind of explains why a lot of the molestation as against children are interfamilial. It's opportunity. And I mean here both temporal opportunity, oh, child is available, child is here, and the person often otherwise has pro-criminal tendencies or might be antisocial. And it's also opportunity about a person who wants to engage in a sexual act with somebody who not, is not necessarily consenting, it's sometimes easier to be able to molest or to get a child than an adult. But the opportunity then is, because the child's available to them, the child is less likely to be able to fight back, the child is less likely to be, to be believed if they report it, and probably less likely to even report it. 
So again, kind of my ideas of, under, of undermining some of the philosophy of the feds as to why they go against child pornography defendants. And real briefly here is um, one of the presumptions too is the feds are mostly going after non-production. It's because production, there's very little evidence that there's much mass production here in the United States. Most of the production of new collections of child pornography occur overseas. But notice some of these things, and this is actually a, a national sample here in the U.S. for production offenses. Uh, there's not much um, domestic production of it, at least for commercial sake. The vast majority of it is by individuals who are doing it for their own private use. A lot of it is from individuals who are known to the child. Again, availability, opportunity, um, and, mo and much of it does not actually involve sexual contact. What I mean there is that much of it is simply photos of the child individually uh, who might be in new positions. <clears throat> Uh, online solicitation, again, a national sample seems to undercut the fear of, um, of even online solicitors. The vast majority of solicitors were very upfront with the children about why they were contacting them. The vast majority of the children who were interviewed said, yes, we knew, I knew what the person wanted. Most of the solicitation is uh, for between the ages of 13 and 17. Now, I should that preface that with, uh, so I've indicated here most seem not to be pedophilic if they're, if they're going after the pubescent and post-pubescents. But I should counter that somewhat with the idea that potentially this may simply be because under 13, not a lot of children have um, unstructured access to the internet. So maybe that's, that could be um, part of what is in play so that adults, for example, or parents might be monitoring under the age of 13 more so, but in any event, this is the result of a national study indicating that potentially the online solicitors are not as dangerous as we might think, or at least they're much more upfront. Uh, the, this particular study also showed that um, it was only a very small percent of times that even online solicitors actually ended up having contact with the victims, and again, most of those seemed to be teenagers who knew what was um, going to be requested of them if they did meet them. So in any event, I see these as three different groups. There are, There is some overlap between these, but not as nearly as much overlap as federal investigators and prosecutors believe there to be. Uh, some national statistics um, to kind of undercut this idea of fear of sexual predators is sex offenses are down dramatically overall. And then if I go over here on to the right on the top there, unlike the presumption, child pornography offenders are at extremely low risk of recidivism, although sex offenders themselves are extremely low risk of recidivism, which is a contrary to the myth that the public has. The public believes, and some studies show, the public believes that sex offenders themselves are at extremely high rate of recidivism and that includes child pornography defendants. Studies consistently show, including national studies by the, the Department of Justice, sex offenders as a group are far less likely to reoffend than any other group. Okay. Now they're a little bit more likely to offend, to do a, a when their reoffense is a sex offense as against other groups, but we're talking about 6%, the national studies show, which is certainly far below what the public believes. Child pornography downloaders are extremely low risk of reoffending of any offense. So they're even less for sex offenders. Now, what's interesting here is that some uh, federal officials have said the, the fact that sex offenses are down and the fact that sex offenders are at low risk of recidivism, they, some of them say, hey, that's because of the sex offender policies we have passed. No, there is no causative link between them. How do I know that? Offense rates across the board are down in the same time period. So it can't just be your specialized sex offense policies. Cr the violent crime in particular is far down. 
And if we go to here the idea of children, the sex offenses against children, it's not that you are, in, you are incarcerating a lot of child pornography defendants. That's not the reason that the rate of sex offense against children is down, because actually the rates of, or actually the measures of child um, welfare, they're all much better. And of course, that can go in either direction. For example, the number of runaways or percentage of runaways are down. The percentage of children and their or their their health measures are up. So it can't. It's not just about their specialized sex offender policies. The other thing I want to mention in terms of this is, uh, and in terms of the feds going after the child porn downloaders versus those who are actually molesting against children. It's not the sexual predator. It's not the stranger. Most sex offenses against sex offense, offenses against children are people known by them. And the younger the age you go here in the U.S., the more likely it's a family member or a family friend. So it's not the stranger you ought to be worried about. It's the people in your own home or known to your home. Again, that relates me back to the idea of opportunity. Opportunity playing a big role in actual contact offenses as against children. Family members have the opportunity. They have the kids who are available to them or family friends who are trusted within the home. Unfortunately, that's not what the feds are going after. They're, they're going after the downloaders often in their, in their basement simply downloading. So I had mentioned here the idea that child pornography defendants are at extreme low risk, even less than sex offenders in general, uh, to recidivate. The reason is because they're different than contact offenders. They're different because they're more highly educated. They're more likely to have jobs. They're more likely to have families. They're better at rehabilitation. And we don't have a whole lot of studies on that, but the studies we do have show they do well in rehabilitation, much better than other types of offenders. There are a few studies about recidivism at the federal level, and they, they also, for child pornography downloaders, indicate they're at very low risk of recidivism. There's one study uh, by uh, Wohler um, that is specifically about federal child pornography defendants, also showing very, very low risk. In fact, in his study, I think he only had like one offender who had recidivated. Any questions so far? Because we're running out of time here. Okay. Got one or two if I can get them in. Um, Oh. It appears that child pornography arrests are an easy way for the FBI to increase their arrest and conviction rates. Is this true? Yes. What I expect. Absolutely. Uh, oh, well, one thing I want to mention, so I had, because um, I don't think I'm going to be able to get to it, although I had mentioned this earlier, is the punishment for child pornography defendants have gone from 20 months of like 20 years ago to now it's ten, not, 8 to 10 years, depending on what district so on the federal level, it can be 120 months. Yes. Yeah. Um, so what has happened uh, is it's easier for them, but what I was going to mention is one of the things they'd like to do is they, they want, they um, use a co-op cooperation to get other defendants. So by getting the online, so they have the technology to find who's, you know, the ones who are online downloading, and then they flip them really quickly. Uh, by using the acceptance of responsibility reduction in the federal sentencing guidelines to be able to get to others. So yes, they, they like to count how many defendants they have and they will promote this, they issue press releases, and that allows them to get to others. Versus if you're getting the, really the person in the house who is actually committing a sex offense against a child, you can't flip them to get other people because usually they're acting on their own. Can you tell us more about the vigilante groups that work with the FBI to, to entrap these people? <laughs> uh, yes, um, what is, uh, yes, um, so the National Missing Children, what is that one called? Yes, so there are groups who act are actively involved with the feds and finding them, but they also, uh, admittedly, they do a lot of good things. For example, they, they do a lot of good work at identifying the victims um, in the photos themselves. Uh, yes, there are a lot of groups who are participating with the federal government to uh, find information on these groups. Oh, uh, one of the things you might not know is actually the feds last year took over a child pornography website and operated it for two weeks. I think WikiLeaks shut them down and they were upset, the feds, because they messed up the Oh, I did not know that part. 
Uh, I don't recall, uh, I, I have in one of my papers the article that exposed that, but there was, a, a, other than that article, there was little public information about this. Um, and so what I argue in terms of what reminded me is your uh, idea of entrapment is, uh, in the federal sentencing guidelines, there are, uh, the federal sentencing guidelines, um, there are guidelines on what an individual defendant ought to be sentenced to. And so for child pornography, there are what are called specific op specific offense characteristics, which increase punishment. Only in uh, They almost always increase rather than decrease punishment. And all of these specific offense characteristics, it's like, did you use a computer? Duh, in this day and age. Uh, how many image, images did you have? Did you have images of children under 12? What I argue in terms of entrapment is that for that two-week period, the government, the feds, could manipulate all of these offense characteristics by simply offering material that clicked all these categories, although obviously they were online. Uh, so yes, they are. Um, the other thing in, that reminds me about the entrapment is uh, there was a CBS uh, news person who contacted me a bit ago, although I haven't seen that his report came out. He had evidence that the feds, in terms of online solicitors, were entrapping. So they would start out online saying, I'm an adult, and they eventually say, I'm 12. Yeah, yeah. And by then, they had lured the person in. But unfortunately, I don't know why his, at least I haven't seen the report come out. Did they have a test like the, you know, I know the static 99 is kind of out of date, but do they have some kind of test like that for child pornography? They do not. And I'll be talking about um, risk assessment tomorrow, including static 99. Uh, that's one of the problems. There is no risk assessment for non-contact offenders, but they use that anyway, even though it was only normed on contact offenders. Yes. Do the feds still use the Butler study? <laughs> I've written about that one, too. Okay. I have a whole article upending the Butler study. Uh, I would, they don't use it as much lately, uh, but they still still do. And uh, So the article I have, if you encounter somebody, the Butler study, oh, for those of you who don't know, the Butler study was a study uh, by actually the feds treatment providers in the federal prison system in Butler, North Carolina. That was where they had their in residence sex offender treatment program. And the people operating this decided to study their own patients. And what they indicated, or the, what the study says is that um, the vast majority of child, federal child pornography defendants had molested in the past and had molested many times. And they indicated they thought they would at risk of molesting in the, in the future. So this became known and the feds then, uh, prosecutors and judges and all sorts of people said, this is proof that child pornography downloading is a proxy to prior molestation and future risk. I, there was a lot of reasons I found and I've written about if you need, if you, yeah, to counter that with social science studies, there's a whole lot of empirical problems with that study. Uh, thank you for mentioning that because I spent a lot of time uh, researching and writing about that particular study. And that's available? Yeah, that, that's available. Oh. Is it the, but, Butler, Butler. leaves the B-U-T-N-E-R. Pardon me? B-U-T. I was talking about her study. B-U-T-N-E-R. This is where you can find uh, that article. So this is a, this is simply a, a academic web page, uh, academic page where us academics can upload our studies that is available for free and anonymous to the public so that you don't have to have a subscription to the law reviews. The study I have about the, or the uh, research paper I have undercutting the Butner study, for example, is there. I get nothing from this. This is no, I, I don't get any money from this. This is simply saying I, I do this research. I want it to be available to people who can use it for free and anonymously so you don't have to I will have no idea if you did it. Um, so, yes. How do you go about pardoning a sex offender from prison? It would, who would? Pardon, besides our, pre our president, I guess. Well, that's not her, her yeah, thing. Um, that's not my bailiff. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, incidentally, on our Texas Voices website under publications, we do have some of her studies there. Oh, and by the way, um, uh, so I'm an academic. If I got anything wrong in a study that I have done or anything you think is wrong, email me. I want to know. I'd rather be right than, yeah. I like criticism. So, yes. 
if you answered this question already, what specifically is it that makes something child porn? Is it his possession of a person in a sexual pose who's 17 years old? Yes. Just having a picture yes. of that? Yes. Does not have to be contact. Does not have to be sent over the internet or mailed? Correct. Just having that picture? Yes. That would be possession. Jeez. Yeah, they had a case here in Texas, uh, that, a picture of a mom nursing her baby. Mm. And that, they, mm. they were arrested for that. Is there any softening at the federal level at all? No, it's going to get worse. So she is asked, is there any softening at the federal level? It's going to get worse. The United States Sentencing Commission issued a report last year, a year ago, two years ago, on specifically on child pornography uh, sentencing. They purported to have done a study about previous molestation as well as future risk. There are a lot of problems with it. I haven't written about it, although I have investigated it. Uh, but what they have come out and said to say is that their specific offense characteristics are outdated. For example, having a use of computers outdated because um, studies I've done on their data sets show that almost all of them have used a computer so it doesn't differentiate uh, one from another. So they have indicated that they're going to change those, but it doesn't seem to be for the better. Uh, they're just going to change them to other reasons to increase sentences. Uh, but what's interesting is they, they have uh, indicated some ways they might do it, but they seem to be waiting for Congress to do something, and Congress is, their attention is elsewhere at the moment. Do they prosecute a lot of juveniles, a lot of anybody under the age of 18? They do, not, not a lot, no. There are some. So here's one of the reasons, <clears throat> oh, by the way, so lunch is now, so if anybody wants to leave, you're welcome to, but I'll stay and talk with whoever wants to. What about guideline changes? Are, I keep hearing oh. about that in the future, in like November 2015. Um, Oh, what was the question? About juvenile. Oh, juvenile. Oh, what I did want to mention is one of the reasons that um, child pornography defendants are not homogenous is unlike almost any other crime, you get them, for example, from extremely young to 99 years old, and you don't see that in other offenses, meaning that it's another indication they're not one class, that there is something very different happening for a 15-year-old versus a 99-year-old. Uh, so the feds do go sometimes go after um, ch uh, juveniles. They don't ver don't see it very often. States are more likely to, um, and the controversy in the states, of course, is sexting. And some states have passed special laws to preclude juveniles who are taking these photos from being prosecuted to the same extent as adults. Because but that can vary. Uh, the other thing I did want to mention, though, in terms of sexual predator civil commitment, is some states will civilly commit juveniles for sex offenses. Uh, but but the other extreme is that at least one state has still in civil commitment a 102-year-old. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, but you were, so you were asking about um, the uh, guidelines. Um, yeah, they're going to change them but not reduce them uh, they, because they have no political traction to do so. The Sentencing Commission is an extremely political group. Uh, Congress has berated them for things such as um, the child pornography guidelines not being as severe. Congress has uniquely directed the Sentencing Commission for Child Pornography Defenses to increase the guidelines range, which they haven't done for almost any other guideline. And so they're politically, they are not about to reduce the guidelines. Even though 70% of sentences in the federal system have gone under the guideline recommendation. 70%, that's also unprecedented. So judges do not like them. Judges are rejecting the child pornography guidelines, but the Sentencing Commission reacting, knowing that Congress, Congress actually, this is on uh, their, their website, there's a video. Congressional members berated the Sentencing Commission about the child pornography guidelines and for judges not abiding by them by having the increased sentences and basically said, what is your salary? Justify your existence. Justify the amount of money we are giving you. Which to me, I read as warning them. Yeah. If you do anything, if you reduce the guideline ranges for child pornography, you are risking your life, you're risking the existence of the commission. Can they do that with mandatory sentencing? It's not mandatory. Uh, the, the, it was intended to be um, just about mandatory, but the Supreme Court in a 2005 decision said for reasons other than it was you know, right to counsel or, reason, or right to a jury trial, um, but not to go too far there, the, uh, sentencing, or the Supreme Court said the sentencing guidelines are recommendations. It, um, so 
that's why it's 70 but there is mandatory sentencing for uh he's telling me to wrap up okay. we're not the filming anymore okay. <laughs> there are no uh, mandatory well there's mandatory minimums is that what you meant yes okay oh. so yes mandatory there's mandatory minimums and here's what's also interesting um and uh also indicative of federal judges thinking that child pornography downloaders, their sentences are too long, they're too extreme, is there's evidence, even in the Sentencing Commission's databases, that they are undermining even mandatory minimums. Uh, the reason for that is there's a mandatory minimum for distribution offenses, and some of them are giving them points on the specific offense characteristic for distribution, but they're under the mandatory minimum, indicating they're undercutting it. They're, they've got a loophole, and some judges are doing that. Can I ask you a question about distribution? Um, it appears to me that the FBI likes to charge a uh, defendant with both distribution and possession, and then um, plea bargain away the distribution in order to get a heavy. Uh, yeah, because distribution has a mandatory minimum. Mm -hmm. so, so and, and as well as a higher starting re uh, sentencing guideline recommendation. Uh, yeah. It just appeared to me from the situation we had with our son that that's what they were doing. I just oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the, so they plea bargain a lot. So the vast majority, another indication of why child pornography defendants are at lower risk is most of them admit it right up front. And most offenders don't do that. They, they admit right up front. Most of them, the vast majority of them plea bargain. vast majority of them plea out and don't go to trial. vast majority of them get acceptance of responsibility because they have uh, admitted it. And many of them also get cooperation credits for giving up information about, for example, the online account they had with others they were sharing it with and what have you. Yes. Um, and prosecutors um, do, do use that. Yes. 